Greetings, friends and colleagues. It really gives me a great pleasure to have the opportunity to address the HPTN, and I want to thank the organizers for asking me to give this presentation. Shown on this first slide, I decided to discuss with you today the public health and scientific challenges associated with the historic pandemic that we are experiencing now of COVID-19. This slide is a shot of a viewpoint that I recently, a few months ago actually, in January of this year, wrote for JAMA. And as you can see from the title, I've decided to call it coronavirus infections more than just the common cold. I was not trying to be facetious. What I was trying to do was to point out to the readers the fact that we have had experience with coronavirus now for many, many decades. In fact, if you look at this phylogenetic tree and you see the human coronaviruses highlighted in red, you know that this virus is also endemic in bats. And in fact, bats may be the primary reservoir of this infection. But four of these coronaviruses that are highlighted in yellow are the common cold coronaviruses. In other words, about 15 to 30% of all the recurrent common colds that we repetitively get each year during the winter months, usually, are caused by these or one or more of these four coronaviruses. And then as the years went by in 2002, we were first uh, met with the first pandemic coronavirus, the SARS coronavirus that emerged from China, from a bat to a civet cat to a human, leading to an outbreak of 8,000 individuals with about 800 deaths. And then there was the MERS outbreak in 2012, again from a bat to a camel to a human, that led to an outbreak that continues at a low level to smolder. Fast forward from 2012 now to 2020, we have the emergence of yet again the third pandemic coronavirus, again emerging out of China in the Wuhan district in central China, first recognized at the end of 2019. The Chinese identified this, put the sequence on a public database, and now we're dealing with the third pandemic coronavirus. As shown here on this phylogenetic tree, it has been called SARS coronavirus 2 because of its phylogenetic proximity to the original SARS coronavirus 1. And so just to be clear, the disease is called COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 2019 because of the emergence in December of 2019, at least to our knowledge, December 2019. And the virus itself, as I mentioned a moment ago, is called SARS coronavirus 2. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with a pandemic of historic proportions, the likes of which nothing we have seen for 102 years since 1918. Right now, as of a couple of days ago, there have been 35 million cases worldwide and over a million deaths. Unfortunately for the United States, we have been the worst hit country in the world with almost 7.5 million cases and about 208,000 deaths. By the time you hear this talk, it will likely be closer to 210,000 deaths. The heat map of the United States shows the relative density of cases per 100,000 population. I want to take a minute to talk a little bit about the difference in response, uh, in, in, in burden, as it were, and response between the United States and Europe. As shown on this slide, the European Union had their peak a little bit before that in the United States. But when they finally turned the corner and came down and locked down, as it were, their baseline number of cases per day was very low, well below 10,000 per day. They're starting to creep up now as they try to reopen their economy and kids come back to school and the weather gets cooler. As you can see, they've inched up now to almost 39,000 per day. The United States, however, was a little different. We peaked predominantly driven by the northeastern part of the country as manifested by the dominating outbreak in the New York metropolitan area, which at one point accounted for about 40% of all the country's infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. 
But as New York brought their cases down to a low baseline, the rest of the country started to surge. And in fact, our baseline never got below 20,000 per day. And in fact, when we had the surge in the South that you recall dominated by Florida, Texas, Arizona, Georgia, and Southern California, we surged up to 70,000 cases per day, came down a little where we're now stuck at 40 to 45,000 cases a day. That's an unacceptable baseline that we can't really get into the fall at that high a level. Why did that happen? Well, if you look at a comparison between the United States and Italy and Spain, which are reflective of the entire European Union, you can measure the extent to which you actually shut down by looking at mobility over time in things like visits to parks and outdoor spaces. As shown on this slide, we did not go down as much as Italy or Spain. The same with regard to workplaces, the United States and the dark line did not go as steeply down as did Italy and Spain. And finally, things like trips to the grocery or pharmacy store, a significant difference between the United States and representative European Union countries. Let me jump now to the virology very quickly. I'm sure the audience is pretty familiar with this. It's a beta coronavirus, an RNA virus with a large genome of 30,000 KB, uh, 30,000 uh, base pairs, four structural proteins. The spike protein is the protein that is the one that has been most well studied because of the receptor binding domain on that spike, which binds to the ACE2 receptor, which is distributed widely throughout the body, particularly in the upper and lower respiratory tract as well as the GI tract. Moving on to transmission, we all know it's a respiratory virus transmitted between people in close contact by both the typical respiratory droplets as well as now increased incidence that a degree of aerosol transmission does take place. The virus is found in a number of body fluids but their role in transmission is unclear both domesticated and zoo animals can get infected again, that is not felt to be a source of human infection. The risk of transmission increases with the duration of exposure and the type of exposure, reason why we talk about keeping distance. Secondary spreader infections generally occur in households as well as in congregate settings in closed spaces such as cruise ships, nursing homes, meatpacking plants. There have been a number of clustered in social gatherings, such as in choirs and in churches. This slide from the CDC speaks about the relative risks, the odds ratio of getting infected if you are in one or more of these places. And notice the data with regard to restaurants, gyms, bars and coffee shops, as well as certain church and religious gatherings. Another aspect of this infection that is unique and very troublesome when one thinks about control is the fact that about 40 to 45 percent of all the infections are actually asymptomatic. Superimposed upon this is the fact that the infections themselves that spread, modeling studies show that a substantial proportion of transmissions occur from an asymptomatic person to an individual who's uninfected. So what are some of the fundamentals for the prevention of acquisition and transmission? They're shown here, and I speak about this continually over and over again. The universal wearing of masks and cloth coverings, maintaining physical distance, the six foot rule, avoiding crowds in congregate settings, always realizing that outdoor functions are always better than indoor functions, including outdoor dining and restaurants, and then finally, frequent washing of hands. The clinical manifestations, particularly early on, resemble very closely a flu-like syndrome as shown on this slide. An interesting peculiarity of this is that in some patients, there's an interesting loss of smell and taste, which generally precedes the onset of the respiratory symptoms. As I mentioned, in addition to the 40 to 45% of people who have no symptoms, 
when one does have symptoms, most of them, about 80%, are mild to moderate, not requiring intervention medically, whereas about 15 to 20% of them are either severe or critical with a case fatality rate that varies from a few percent to up to 20 to 25% of individuals who require mechanical ventilation. The manifestations of severe disease are predominantly the acute respiratory syndrome, but as we learn more and more about this extraordinary disease, we find that some patients, in fact, a reasonable percentage of patients have other organ system involvement with cardiac injuries manifested by arrhythmias and cardiomyopathies, acute kidney injuries, neurological disorders, an interesting hypercoagulable state with microthrombi and embolism, thromboembolic phenomenon leading to acute strokes, and also a very interesting multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children with now over 800 cases reported worldwide. The people who are at increased risk for severe COVID illness are adults. And when one looks at the data, you see the extraordinary progression of rate of hospitalization per 100,000 population as one gets older and older in the age bracket with very few hospitalizations in children and very young adults and adolescents to the high level as seen in individuals 75 years of age or older. In addition, people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions are at an increased risk for severe disease. Some of these that are strongly associated with an increased risk are shown on this slide. I point out specifically things that are of high association, such as obesity, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, serious heart disease, but essentially everything you see on this slide. There are other conditions with less of a clear cut association that may confer increased risk. They're shown on this slide, I might point out one or two of them that appear to have a, of a, of a greater degree of risk than others, and that is hypertension, chronic lung disease, and diabetes. I also want to point out the issue of immunocompromised state, including HIV individuals. And there's a lot of discussion about that, but we're learning more and more about the relative risk in HIV infected individuals. And to make quite a long story somewhat shorter, it's the HIV comorbidities that are the potential risk factors for COVID-19, especially in older individuals. And in fact, there have been a few studies, here's one by Carlos Del Rio, in which they looked at a number of studies in Europe and the United States, and the major method, excuse me, the major message of this is that comorbidities is the major driver of severe COVID-19 in persons with and without HIV co-infection. So HIV alone does not give you a higher risk. It's the comorbidities, particularly things like uh, increased manifestations of aging that we know so well in HIV infected individuals and some of the other comorbidities they have. Here's another study of an analysis of greater than 50,000 people with COVID-19, including over 400 people who have both HIV and SARS. And again, higher morbidity is seen in people with HIV and that's driven by the higher uh, burden of comorbidities. Moving on to another disturbing part about all of this is the racial and ethnic disparities, namely African-American, Latinx, and uh, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Pacific Islanders who have an increased incidence of getting infected in the first place and because of their comorbidities, an increased incidence of serious consequences of infection. And again, using the parameter of the rate of hospitalizations per 100,000 population, just take a look at the dramatic difference between Hispanic, Latinx, Black, non-Hispanics, and whites with 360 plus in the Hispanics and the Blacks and only 80 in the white, a major, major difference. With regard to therapeutics, the NIH has put together a treatment guidelines panel, which is actually a group that is producing a living document accessible online 
at the link shown on this slide, COVID-19 treatment guidelines.nih.gov, which is updated in real time as new data become available to assist clinicians throughout the country and the world in the treatment of patients with COVID-19. This is a list of some of the therapeutics. I will get to the remdesivir and dexamethasone in a moment, but first let's look at some of the investigational therapies that are being pursued. There are direct antivirals, blood-derived products such as convalescent plasma, which has an EUA, but which we're still trying to determine if it really does work in the sense is really effective. We believe it's safe. Clinical trials will show that shortly. There's monoclonal antibodies, there's immune modulators such as cytokine inhibitors, as well as adjunct therapies such as anticoagulants. I wanna make just a brief comment about monoclonal antibody studies, because this is an area that people are getting very excited about, is being tested in the outpatient basis as inpatient doing family prophylaxis studies, whereas one member of the family is infected and you prophylact the rest of the family to see if you could prevent intra-family spread. And then there's the primary prophylaxis in nursing homes. Now let's get back to the remdesivir and the dexamethasone. These are two that have been shown by randomized placebo-controlled trials to work. What do we mean? First, remdesivir was the first of the randomized placebo-controlled trials that were used in over a thousand individuals in 10 countries in the United States, Europe, and Asia. The result was that in hospitalized patients requiring lower dose oxygen, there was a significant diminution in the time to uh, recovery or essentially leaving the hospital. A UK study in over 6,000 patients, again, another randomized placebo-controlled trial of individuals with advanced disease, hospitalized, on ventilators, or receiving oxygens, the study showed a significant diminution in 28-day mortality. Of note, the dexamethasone was not only not effective in earlier patients, but actually could be harmful, which really goes along with our knowledge of the pathogenesis of this disease, where you want to attack the virus early on and leave the immune system intact, whereas later on, you want to blunt the aberrant inflammatory and immunological responses. Let me close with a brief discussion of vaccines. We have taken a strategic approach to COVID-19 vaccine research and development as shown on this commentary that my colleagues and I wrote in science a few months ago. By strategic approach, we mean we wanna harmonize the approach by getting a, a, a harmonized protocol using a common DSMB aiming at common primary and secondary endpoints and using common immunological parameters for correlates of immunity. This is a list of the three platforms that are being pursued, nucleic acid with mRNA, viral vectors, including ChimpAD, HumanAD, and VSV, as well as protein subunits with and without adjuvants. As shown on the right-hand part of the slide, five out of the six of these are already in phase three trials. Two went early on in July, July 27th, the Moderna and the Pfizer trial went on. We expect that by November or December, we will have results that will tell us whether we have a safe and effective vaccine. Obviously, as all of you know, there's no guarantee, but we have cautious optimism given what we've seen in animal studies and in the early phase one trials, which indicated rather robust neutralizing antibody response, we feel cautiously optimistic that we will have a vaccine in November or December that we can begin to distribute according to the prioritization that has been suggested by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and the National Academy of Medicine. This is a map showing some of the sites for the NIID COVID-19 Prevention Network. As seen here, many of these sites you're very familiar with because they've really incorporated the clinical network sites that we've used for HPTN, HVTN, and ACTG. These will be well used now as we take things that we've been successful in the past and apply them to the rather substantial challenge 
we're facing with COVID-19. I'd like to stop there and thank again the organizers for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. next is two things. First, I'll just really briefly give the state of the network, which will not really give the way forward. WAFA is going to give the way forward, which will summarize what we're pretty sure is going to happen in the next year or so. So I think it's really important. I guess we're organizing this in a way so that we can try and keep everybody together for two hours. And right after I talk, this kind of state of the network will be followed by what's really important to this network, um, our Ward Kate Spirit Award. So, so that's the two things that are going to happen next. So state of the network. Everyone on this call realizes that we have a mission of preventing HIV short of a vaccine. We use integrated strategies. We try and improve pre-exposure prophylaxis, and we are very focused on the populations at greatest risk for uh, acquisition of HIV. 2020, even in spite of COVID, was a really important year for the uh, Prevention Trials Network. We completed two really important studies, uh, which I, I guess I'll, I'll say a word about in the next few minutes. We have 13 studies ongoing. Um, there are new studies in development. We have uh, currently more than 65 active uh, dedicated sites and many more sites that are um, have been added on. Uh, there were 31 presentations and more than 50 publications. So we think we had a, a good year as a network. The thing I'm going to focus a lot about the tools that go in the toolbox and WAFA in, uh, going forward, we'll talk about integrated strategies in much greater detail. The, the tools that exist today are you know, oral uh, TDF FTC and the alfinamide version of this. Both have been approved and both proved to be very successful agents, as everyone knows. Um, one of the problems with the oral agents has been um, either the uptake or adherence or what is now called persistence, that is continued use. Connie Here Kellerman. You are unmuted. Hi, Kai. This is Eric. Sorry to interrupt. It, uh, again, another glitch we're experiencing. Uh, I'm told that uh, you, are, you might not be on the English channel, so some people are having uh, difficulty hearing your presentation. How, how do I sound in another language? Uh, well, you need to go to the the um, the globe, the interpretation icon, and just select English. Okay, uh, this is going to require me. Well, first of all, this is a bizarre situation. I guess I'm going to have to stop sharing. Go to the globe, select English. Now what? There you go. We can hear your mic now. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you for. <laughs> all right. I am going to. Quickly, okay. then go. I'm going to go back to where I was really quickly if I can do it. Share. Oops. Is my screen visible? Mm. Yes, but if you can. Yes, it is. Into, you can just return to the presentation mode. Presentation mode, yeah. Okay. Now I don't have any idea what language you were hearing me in. Is this in English uh, now? We are <laughs> hearing you in English. My okay, I, hear, I think we've unleashed the translator again, but I am going to talk no matter what. Waf and I are going to proceed. <laughs> this is a network summary. We've had a robust year. Uh, we are focused a lot on PrEP. Two PrEP agents have been approved. Uh, in that universe, one of the problems has been persistent adherence. Um, Eric, can, can you try and mute the uh, Thai translator? Or impossible. Okay. We are working on that, Mike. I'm just going to continue, and I apologize, but I will bear through this. Uh, we we are excited about Connie Kellum's study, led by Connie, but with many others, called HBTN082. This particular study um, was trying to determine whether if the drugs were provided, we could see um, adherence and persistence. The study has been completed, and um, the important thing is that... Um, very few women acquired uh, HIV. Um, and in the context of this, this success, we're trying to understand the degree of, of uh, the exact basis of this benefit as kind of summarized on this slide. 
Cái này là cái slide này là uh, tổng um, kết lại. I would point out that the network supported a study that was published just very recently in Lancet and HIV about the initiation, discontinuation, and restarting of, of uh, oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. And in the, in the context of, of um, this work, this is a collaboration with the CDC and WHO. So, Truvada has been TDF-FTC and the alfenamide version have been widely successful agents, but it's of course to the, up to the network to develop the next generation of, of agents. The focus of our work, um, the MTN has worked a lot on rings, but there are other agents that are forthcoming and they're shown on this slide. I would emphasize how proud we are of the work of the HPTN 083 and 084 teams. I think everyone on this call is familiar with the uh, 083 study, um, which um, was a randomized double-blind controlled trial of, of TDF-FTC and, and, and injectable long-acting tabatagravir. And um, this study was completed. Um, or I, I should say, it, it was complete. It was, the, the DSMB indicated that, that sufficient success had been observed that we should uh, uh, interrupt the study and go to the third phase of the study. Um, the, and this is sort of a summary on the slide of what the DSMB told us um, on May 18th. And then there was a press release on July, July 7th. And, and Beatrice uh, Cook presented the uh, preliminary results in, in okay, multiple, multiple mới, places. John Cohn in an editorial pointed out, while well, it's not a vaccine, it's a really good contribution uh, because of its long acting nature and its successful ability that as cabotrophic uh, you're long acting to uh, prevent the acquisition of the uh, uh, I would say that the okay, takeaway you know, message is that when we directly compare in uh, uh, a RC, a double blinded, uh, double dummy randomized controlled trial, that what was observed was that in, in many ways what was anticipated. Cabotegravir ultimately proved superior to the TDF FTC combination. However, both agents are, are very, very active. So the incidence of HIV in the face of these agents is very, very low. The real difference is what was, would have been anticipated, that an injection does not depend on daily human behavior. The limitation of pills for any disease is you know, the dependence on, on adherence to a daily oral regimen. Um, Dr. Landovitz, Grinstein, and others are working on manuscripts that have two really important purposes. They will, they will provide the results in great detail that have been presented in abstract form. And they'll also inform in much greater detail about kind of biological observations that resulted from this very large, very successful trial. Now, I think everyone's aware that um, uh, providing pre-exposure prophylaxis successfully to women is critical. It brings us back to Dr. Kellum's study, HBTN082 providing a pill, TDF-FTC, as a prevention um, agent, and um, Mina Sinapur and Sinead Delaney have been uh, working on the uh, sister study of HPT083, HPT084. It got started later than HPT083. It is ongoing. The next DSMB is in November. We have every reason to hope and believe that uh, cabotegravir long acting will work very well in women and we'll kind of keep you informed of what happens next. And this, the HBTN 084 study design is identical to the HBTN 083 study design. Now, historically, uh, adolescence at great risk left out because for a variety of reasons and, and attending to the, the network has attended to this. Um, and um, started the HBTN 08301 study, Prevention for Teens in both uh, young men uh, and uh, women. And these are bridges uh, 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 the, uh, the success of these agents allow us to, uh, to uh, in the adult population, with sufficient experience in, in, in teens, we could bridge to teens and make such agents available to them to protect them as well. I think everyone's also aware that Another idea of a pre-exposure prophylaxis is the use of antibodies. And, and the news is filled with antibodies today in infectious diseases, topic of great interest. For, for the HPTN, we, we work with the Vaccine Trials Network and the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH to take forward um, the first antibody out of the gate, BRCO1. This was conducted, the BRCO1 antibody study was conducted 
Okay. Um, in the uh, AMP studies, uh, antibody um, mediated prevention studies, where we compared uh, um, see, uh, two more. different doses of VRCO1 given every eight weeks uh, to uh, uh, placebo VRC control. Uh, the, these studies, the passive immunity VRCO1 studies have been completed. They were never designed to develop a drug. They were designed to explore the proof of concept that an antibody was biologically active and could get into the spaces required, the human spaces, human tissues required, to prevent the acquisition of HIV. Um, not, maybe not surprisingly, results are complicated when you do this kind of a study. So the study has been completed, the study has been completed and um, we are currently exploring the best ways to present the results to the general community um, in abstract form. Uh, in, uh, in, um, it, well, uh, we would have provided it in abstract form, but there have been no meetings to provide abstracts. So we have generated or are in the process of generating a manuscript that would convey in great detail these, what we think are in, very informative results about um, the use of, of broad neutralizing antibodies in the space. Uh, we hope that, and then preceding any publication, we would have the opportunity to, uh, to discuss this with the um, stakeholders in greater detail and the study subjects and the community. And all of this is kind of in the works. The reason I'm, I'm not really kind of just going into great detail about the results um, is because we are still trying to interpret them uh, properly before we convey them. Um, but the study has been completed. I can tell you that the study is viewed by the investigators in the NIH as a success and has met its objectives. And I think there'll be more information forthcoming this fall. I will say by kind of a way of a clue that the reason we never thought that we were making a drug with the monoclonal antibody VRCO1 the broad neutralizing of VRCR1 that many of you participated in, because we always thought we needed multiple antibodies. And as a kind of forewarning, the results of the study uh, will, um, I think, um, further emphasize the idea that if we're gonna make a drug of monoclonal antibodies or broad neutralizing antibodies, we'll probably use a cocktail. And other studies have been ongoing already in the PTN to explore a more advanced version of VRCO1 called VRCO7, now much longer acting because of a mutation, um, and another drug called PGT121, and a third drug called PGM1400. This kind of cocktail of, of antibodies is a theme that is important in developing an antibody-mediated infectious disease prevention and treatment. Um, and as I think Tony talked about, Dr. Fauci talked about just a little while ago, you saw this kind of cocktail developed uh, by Regeneron in a similar fashion for the use of COVID, um, both for prevention and treatment of COVID. And I, I anticipate that in the, in the next few months, we'll be discussing um, in more detail the cocktails of antibodies that might be used for uh, uh, prevention or treatment and prevention of uh, HIV infection. So in summary to this point, we have gotten pretty far. We've uh, really made considerable progress towards getting approval of cabotegravir long acting as a, as a preventive agent uh, world, for worldwide usage. And we have completed our AMP study and we're proud of that. But that's obviously not enough. What's next? Well, there are new ARVs. This Latrivir is the Merck drug that's a pill that lasts at least a month. And it can also be made as an implant. And, and Merck is working on that. Gilead is working on a, what's called a capsid inhibitor that uh, a drug that when given subcutaneously can last for several months. Um, and again, Gilead's excited about that agent both for treatment and prevention. So again, we're in a space where uh, treatment and prevention come together, they're married, and the agents for one might be beneficial for the other. There are new devices, the Depivirin rings that everyone in this call is familiar with um, have received a, a favorable review from the uh, European uh, Medicine Agency medicines agency, and, and I, I believe that, that I'm quite sure that the um, investigators working on, on rings are hoping to take those forward. And I'll say a few minutes, a, a word more about that in a second. There are implants and transdermal needles and multi-purpose technologies. The multi-purpose technology idea, um, and in our group that's being led by Sharon Hillier and a team, that's the idea that we can put together um, agents that might prevent uh, that might serve as birth control, 
as well as HIV prevention and perhaps STD prevention as well, STI prevention as well. So there's a lot of interest in multipurpose technologies and the network is really concerned or committed to that agenda. As I've indicated, there is, there's no, I've talked mostly about our tools that go in the toolbox, but of course, behavioral interventions are, are critical tools as we've certainly seen in the last few months. And what, what the PTN is committed to is uh, biomedical interventions, behavioral interventions, and structural interventions used concomitantly. Um, this was the, the purpose of HBTN 071 POPAR to integrate strategies. And that is another, I think, success over the last uh, year. Um, Waffle we'll say probably a word more about that. I would point out that when we did pop art, we also committed an enormous number of resources, uh, more, uh, enormous amount of resources to analysis, phylogenetic analysis led by Christoph Fraser and others. Um, and Christoph um, has made a series of observations about wh why pop the success of pop art and the limitations of the success. And, and he's analyzing the success and limitations using phylogenetic analysis. And maybe the results aren't all that surprising, but he's able to show um, uh, why transmissions occurred using these tools. And a, a series of papers related to pop art and the use of phylogenetics will be published in the near future. Uh, as I said on this slide, missing 25 to 40 year old men is a big gap and accounts for many transmissions. And then as we've already, as we know, uh, unrecognized and acute infections account for many transmissions. Lastly, we see transmissions coming from people who migrate into the area. So I'd keep my eyes open for what we think is this very uh, uh, important phylogenetic work. The, so the way forward is going to be discussed in a little more detail uh, at the end of this webinar by WAFA. Uh, none of this happens without our community programs. Um, I think everyone recognizes that we, we cannot say enough about how we try everything we do. We try and first talk and integrate all of these things into the community. All discoveries are presented to the community and all, hopefully all the discoveries benefit the community. I can't say enough about the scholars program. Our obligation is not just to this generation, but the next generation, probably when and, uh, Croatia and Stan Vermund, have been, uh, and others have led this program um, very successfully. Uh, there have been 64 scholars, which amazes me over the last 10 years. The mentorship of our of, of investigators in the PTN has been remarkable. Um, and lots of the data that's available from our studies has been made available to the scholars who published, a again, a remarkable 34 manuscripts. I wanna end just to explain something that might not be obvious. So in, in summary from my part of the talk, which is just about over, um, we've made a lot of progress this year. I've emphasized in the tools and the, and the way forward is gonna be described at the end of the morning in a talk called The Way Forward. But clearly COVID has played a huge, uh, has had a huge effect on the network. We actually have a metric called the COVID disruption metric, metric to decide how much we can continue clinical trials worldwide in the face of COVID. <clears throat> but it's also important that the investigators on this call that represent prevention trials network sites, all of virtually all have been asked to help with COVID as well. And that's a complement to the kind of um, strengths of the network. So the NIH uh, uh, had a, trans network consideration of all the infrastructure that could be brought to bear to COVID. And in the NIAID, the PTN, the Vaccine Trials Network, the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, ACTG, as well as another group called the <coughs> Infectious Disease Clinical Research Consortium, which is in DEMID, not DAIDS, the Division of Microbiology. All four of those organizations were brought together to form a new network that would do nothing but focus on COVID prevention, the COVID prevention network. And it's an aggregation of these other networks. And this is the way it's organized. And I know because all of you are participating, I just wanted to say a word about it. The FDA, of course, the NI, uh, HHS, of course, is on top of this pyramid. And then there's a partnership with the networks I've already described to you, the pharmaceutical industry, and the NIH. And, and what is shown on the slide at the bottom is the COVID prevention network is kind of divided up as follows. That the West Coast, where the VTN resides at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, they've really spearheaded the vaccine activities in the network and, and, uh, uh, the, and the East Coast uh, focus at FHI and uh, um, uh, in our communities on the East Coast 
have focused more on monoclonal antibodies. And, and I can say that, that, that this COVID prevention network, which is really a parallel sister network, the PTN has made great progress. Um, I'd also point out that the uh, Wafa and Jessica Justman and others are working on, on um, looking um, at um, the continued benefit of using all these network sites in terms of acquisition to patients or people, people at risk for COVID or who acquire COVID. Lastly, so our COVID prevention network monoclonal antibody work, which only started six months ago, has already helped to lead to um, agents that have proven some efficacy in the treatment space. And just last week, uh, Lily and Regeneron, our partners in the COVID prevention network, announced very preliminary but very provocative results showing that their monoclonal antibodies could serve as antiviral agents by reducing the viral burden pretty quickly in the nose. That, that kind of um, observation is really important to us. It brings back our memories of HIV prevention, um, where uh, HIV treatment and prevention, where HIV active agents drop the viral burden in the blood. So the, the nose, be, uh, viral load in the nose has become a really important surrogate. And, and these agents are very provocative. And I will uh, forewarn that, that the companies making uh, these agents have already submitted uh, uh, manuscripts to, um, uh, our journals, and so we should see the detailed results, I'd say, in the next 30 days of, of these studies. So this is a brief overview of this year. Again, Waf and I both apologize for all the disruption as we try and be a virtual network today. Uh, we really appreciate your being on this call. I hope you'll stay tuned to hear the way forward uh, in 2021, which Waf will, will provide. Obviously, I can't thank enough all the study participants and communities that, that work with us, the, our, our site investigators. At, at, at really, when we look at the uh, PTN sites, I think there's <coughs> almost there's 75 or 80 sites uh, or more. Um, the, uh, we're going forward with a similar number of sites uh, you know, dedicated and, and, and study-specific sites going forward. We need to thank all of our funders who are listed in the slide and all of our pharmaceutical collaborators um, and all of the working groups that inform how the PTN should move forward. Um, it's been a very successful year. This is, is my summary. Um, and now what I'm going to do next, without delay, well, I, I don't know if we had time for questions and answers, but given that we've lost some time this morning, I won't answer any questions. That becomes very easy. Waffle will answer all questions at the end. Um, having said that, I am going to try and stop sharing one screen and go to my next screen. Eric, is that okay if I do it this way? Please go ahead, Mike. Okay, I am gonna go right into, with no further ado, and we're gonna leave questions to the end to save time. I'm gonna go into what I think is in many ways, and I think you can see my screen, I hope. I am going to go into what is for most of us in this network, a kind of really, um, a highlight of our, our time together, but a, um, something that, that has an emotional effect on most of the people who've worked together for so long. So I'm gonna now discuss Ward Cates and the Ward Cates Spirit Award. Ward Cates, who many of you know, and I, I, those who don't know him have really missed something in their lives. He was born in 1942 in Rye, New York. He was, as a young man, athletic, charming, and funny. And as an old man, he was athletic, charming, and funny. So he never lost those three facts. He was married to Joan Cates, and, and Joan Cates is still doing quite well. He's got two daughters, Sarah and, uh, and Deborah, and four grandchildren. He, Ward, would, would have, I wouldn't say enjoyed, he'd be interested in our current era. Ward was an enormous champion of women's health from the beginning of his career. Um, he worked at the CDC at a critical time and led efforts to make abortion safe and legal. And in those efforts, were uh, demonstrated in the publication of, I think he published more than a hundred papers about the benefits of Roe v. Wade in, in the shortest uh, possible time. He had an illustrious academic career. The award we'd like to give is based on outstanding commitment and leadership to health as a right, both internationally and domestically for scientific excellence, for generosity and magnanimity and mentorship and support for personal values that Ward really, as an inspiring character demonstrated integrity, honesty, loyalty, loyalty unwavering um, 
uh, support for his colleagues and courage, the courage to, to deal what he dealt with throughout his career was remarkable. He was a courageous advocate and a compassionate human being. This is a picture of war that all, <clears throat> all of us love. So the first award went to Ken Mayer, who everybody knows. The second award went to Stan Vermund, who everybody knows. The third award went to Quraysh Abdul Karim, who everybody knows. The fourth award went to James Akeem. And, and I would just comment, this award has kind of gained momentum because I remember last year when we could all be together, it was unbelievably moving how people ran to James and embraced him because they saw how we feel about this. So this year's award, I have the great privilege of announcing, will go to Tom Fleming uh, at the University of Washington. Now, why would we give this award to Tom Fleming? And all of you know Tom, virtually everybody in this network knows Tom, and all of you have been inspired, inspired or kind of confused by Tom's teaching. I'd say inspired. Tom is a consummate teacher. And, and I think there's, at our meetings, there's nothing more than people like to spend two hours with Tom, who's so passionate about the way to do clinical trials. And Tom is a professor of statistics at University of Washington. He's been on the Food and Drug Advisory Committee for many, he's advised the Food and Drug Committee over, over, over. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine. He was, um, when I first got to know Tom in the very beginning, these are the old days with Ward as the principal investigator of the PTN, where Tom, where Ward uh, came to admire and uh, Tom. Uh, he's received an FDA special citation for his work. He's monitored uh, greater than 100 clinical trials, which I, I don't even think that's possible. I don't see how that's possible, to be honest, but he says he did it, so we'll believe him. Um, <laughs> he's the author of hundreds of papers, and everyone in the world who does clinical trials is forced, has no alternative but to know Tom because they use the O'Brien Fleming method of, of monitoring the boundaries of clinical studies. On a personal note, I'll say that for those of you who remember HPG 052, I will tell you that Ward, Tom, and I talked virtually every week for about a year. We had a once a week discussion about what are we doing? That's basically the story. I, I can tell you unequivocally, Ward loved Tom. He loved talking to Tom. He was inspired by Tom. He understood Tom. Um, and, and I think Ward would be so pleased as I am that Tom is the recipient of this award. Now, Carl Diefenbach is with us on behalf of the NIH and Tony Fauci, and I'm hoping we, he can be unmuted. I'm praying Carl can be unmuted. Yes, Carl, can. Carl, can you be unmuted? Yes. I am unmuted. Um, yeah. This award yeah. is, mm -hmm. can everybody hear me? Yes. Thank yeah. you. But, um, it is a pleasure to be here uh, speaking to all of you today at the HPTN um, event. Uh, and to have seen the history on the, um, the Spirit Award. Um, Ward has had such a profound impact on all of us and this specific award at this point in time, going to Tom today is so critical given where we are on our clinical trials, not just in HIV, but in coronavirus disease. And being able to have the O'Brien Fleming rule to lean on to help us make the right decisions and avoid the politics associated with unblinding the vaccine trials is so essential. So Tom, your, your reach and influence continues to grow. Everybody is leaning on you and your, your, um, your legacy to help us sort out the wheat from the chaff and bring forward effective vaccines for coronavirus disease, and then allow us to get back to our work on HIV. I'll stop there. Um, thank you. Oh, thank, thanks, Carl. Tom, do you want to say a few words? Uh, well, Car Carl and Mike, uh, if you can hear me, um, ahead, this is Tom. Uh, thank you so much for remembering Ward. You're unmute. Your mic is not working, maybe? You're unmuted, but your mic may not be working. Uh, Tom, you need... He may need Tom, to select the English language. Okay. Tom, try again. You might be in Thai, however. <laughs> okay, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yay. Yes. Okay, great. Yay. Thank you. So I was just uh, saying this is humbling, uh, thanking Carl and Mike in particular for remembering Ward. Uh, what we accomplish in HBTN, we do together. Uh, and, and essentially, we're following Ward Kate's remarkable spirit. Um, his spirit gave us and gives us such a high standard that we 
continually strive to achieve. For when it was ward, for ward it was win, win, win. That it was win by setting high scientific standards, being efficient, but most importantly, by benefiting the populations in need. Uh, and uh, it's, it's wonderful to celebrate and remember Ward's spirit and his inspiration as we continue to pursue this extraordinary agenda that uh, has been so effectively lay, let out, uh, laid out and that uh, is being led by Mike and Wafa. So thanks so much to all of you. And, and again, thanks so much to Ward for his inspiration. Tom, th thanks for those comments. And I think all of us who loved Ward really know he would have loved that you received this award. Good afternoon, everyone. My co-presenter, Cheryl, D Diane Blanchett, and I, we have the privilege of presenting some of the community engagement successes of HPTN 083, which is the injectable cabotegravir study. So we'll start out with a brief overview of study recruitment and retention, and then speak about study pre-implementation and implementation strategies, and then close with some final thoughts. So let's begin with a really brief overview. I'm not gonna go into detail about study design as Dr. Cohen has provided an overview of the study and its incredible findings. But for this presentation, however, we would like to note that the study sought to enroll 5,000 study participants from 43 sites in seven countries in North and South America, Asia, and then also South Africa. We had a total of 4,570 HIV uninfected participants who were enrolled between December 2016 and March 2020. And these enrollments, they included 37% of participants from the United States, 43% from Latin America, 16.5% from Asia, and then 3.5% um, of participants from South Africa. There were a total of 4,565 participants who were included in the study's primary analysis. And the protocol and the clinical research teams diligently worked to achieve representation from some very important groups for HIV prevention through the establishment of recruitment goals. <clears throat> and the, the teams met or exceeded those established goals as seen in the recruitment table there on the top. The average study age for participants was 28 years. 66% of participants were under the age of 30. 40% were under the age of 25. 12% of overall enrollment were transgender women. And 50% of the participants enrolled in the United States self-identified as African-American or Black. Study retention was good with 91% at month 6, 87% at month 12, 80% at month 18, and 74% at month 24. Now, how is this possible, you might ask? Um, through hard work, partnership building, and innovation. And of course, supportive protocol leadership. So just want to give a quick shout out to Drs. Rafi Landovitz and then also Dr. Beatrice Greenstein. Network and site community engagement teams, they utilize several principles from good participatory practice guidelines and the conduct of HPTN 083. The GPP guidelines were developed by AVAC and UNAIDS, and they provide trial funders, sponsors, and implement, implementators with systemic, systematic guidance on how to effectively engage with all stakeholders in the design and conduct of biomedical HIV prevention trials. So one of the first strategies um, was the formation of three <laughs> HPTN 083 community working groups, one for the United States, one for South American countries, which included the South Africa clinical research site, and a third for Asian countries. These CWGs are committees of clinical research site representatives and community specialists that advise and advocate for community participation at all levels of the research process. And they also ensure community participation is adequately addressed at the clinical research sites and in the management of the conduct of HPTN 083. The aim of these groups is to enhance study-specific community strategies and identify possible challenges. 
These aims are achieved through the development of community engagement work plans, informing clinical research site of potential social harms which may emerge, assisting in the development of study specific educational toolkits and communication plans, and then also conducting community preparedness and ongoing involvement activities to ensure the successful conduct of studies through community partnerships. Community educators and CAD members are afforded the opportunity to share best practices, challenges, and possible solutions with their colleagues who are implementing the study in a different city, state, or even country. Another strategy was the conduct of international and I mean, internal and external community stakeholder consultations. The HPTN recognized that trial success required local implementators, part potential participants and advocates to partners with the trial designers. And these partnerships facilitated early ownership of the research by key decision and policymakers. This inclusion enabled generous local insight into successful implementation of a complex biomedical HIV prevention in intervention and added value of transparent, authentic dialogue about a wide range of trial considerations. We partnered with several organizations and advocates to conduct seven consultations with cisgender Black men who have sex with men and transgender women in the United States. And these organizations included the Black AIDS Institute, NASM, the Red Door Foundation, and of course the HPTN Zone Black Caucus. These consultations serve as a as a call to action to identify best practices for PrEP uptake in Black and transgender communities and the development, implementation, and implementation of strategies with participation from policymakers, local leaders, researchers, and then experts. We also conducted eight interactive capacity building sessions, which provided the opportunity for community educators to share and build strategies related to community engagement, recruitment, and retention. We conducted at least one training in each of the geographic regions to provide opportunity for exchange of best practices that were culturally applicable. Those community education trainings focused on capacity building to explain the science of PrEP to lay audiences, as well as answer difficult questions in the field. Community educators were also provided the opportunity to practice <clears throat> the knowledge gained through mock outreach sessions. Also in an effort to support enrollment of transgender women and US cisgender black men who have sex with men, the Black Caucus, along with representatives from the Dade's Transgender Working Group, con conducted a hybrid model of the presence at the table cultural responsive training for the sites in the United States. The presence at the table is a group level training that builds respect for diversity and cultural differences and improves accountability through measurement, reporting, and ongoing improvement. The training was updated to incorporate modules developed by the HIV Vaccine Trials Network that focus on increasing capacity to provide cultural appropriate services to transgender people. This training was facilitated for the U.S. sites only as the sites in South America and Asia had extensive rapport built and experience working with transgender populations. Three subsequent trainings which focused specifically on transgender women were provided by the DAIDS Transgender Working Group for the Global HPTN Community Working Group. I'm now going to pass the baton to the Lead Community Program Manager for HPTN 083, Cheryl Blanchett who will provide an overview of the implementation strategies for HPTN 083. Thank you, Jonathan, and hello, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, but as Jonathan said, like next, we're just gonna take a look at um, the range of materials that were developed for HPTN 083. The community working groups were extremely instrumental in identifying items that we needed um, for community engagement and recruitment. The HPTN 083 CWG selected or provided the images that were needed for the campaign, as well as provided feedback on language and product design. HPTN LOC staff um, from the communications and the community program teams used the feedback that were provided by the CWG to develop the following print and electronic materials for community education and recruitment. Those materials included palm cards and recruitment flyers with tear sheets, an HPTN 083 fact sheet, 
an HPTN 083 study FAQ. And then there was a PowerPoint, um, an education PowerPoint for the study, as well as a Cabotegravir animation. Sites were given the flexibility to either use the education materials from the centralized marketing campaign um, that was developed with work through the HPT and LOC, or to develop their own community appropriate materials with the study approved messaging. The Give Prep a Shot website was also developed in conjunction with the community working group. The website was available in five languages. That was English, Spanish, Portuguese, Vietnamese, and Thai. And the website provided an overview of the study as well as information about the sites conducting the study. The HPTN communications department worked closely with the CWG and the protocol team to develop a study launch plan, which included a 60 minute Twitter chat as well as a 60 minute webinar that provided a study overview and gave national stakeholders the opportunity to ask questions directly to the study leadership team. The webinar was attended by over 600 stakeholders in the United States. The communication team then also worked, um, well, I should say they used Facebook and Twitter to provide periodic study updates throughout the year um, to highlight the extraordinary work happening at the sites participating in HPT 083. We also conducted a social media recruitment campaign, and that was done on Facebook and Instagram for the U.S. and Brazil sites. This resulted in 11,000 pre-screens for enrollment. These campaigns specifically targeted young Black MSM and transgender women. Most noteworthy, though, was the innovation of sites for their community recruitment, um, community engagement, and retention practices. Sites conducted a plethora of events to increase community awareness of HPT and 03 and bolster recruitment, retention, and study results dissemination. Balls, paint and sip parties, beauty pageants, kickball and softball games. There was event tabling, movie nights, dinners, sponsored parties at nightclubs, and the list just really goes on and on. Um, the study really would have never achieved the recruitment goal without the diligent work of the site community program staff and the CADs. The HPTN is committed to the highest ethical standards for its clinical trials and recognizes the importance of community engagement in all phases of the research process. Engaging community members in problem solving solutions to issues that affect them is one of the fundamental principles of HIV prevention research. It is a critical strategy for partnership building to advance HIV prevention efforts, particularly with marginalized groups. Now we would just like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank all those who contributed and worked endlessly towards the success of HPT and 083. Those of course include our community engagement staff and SCABs, the HPT and 083 community working group and protocol team, the protocol chairs that Jonathan um, named, Dr. Landovitz and Dr. Greenstein, um, the clinical research management team, the HPT and Black Caucus, and the Division of AIDS Cross Network Transgender Working Group. And lastly, but certainly not least, we would like to recognize and thank the funders of HPTN083, HPT the U.S. National Institutes of Health and Viv Healthcare, as well as Viv Healthcare and Gilead Sciences for the pharmaceutical support provided. We really just thank everyone for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan and, uh, and Cheryl for uh, really your amazing work. I think it's, uh, it's wonderful to see everything pulled together and, uh, and to show all the enormous efforts that, uh, that were mobilized in order to uh, actually make the, the study such a, a successful endeavor. I think it involved uh, commitment and creativity and engagement and uh, just determination uh, to make it happen. Um, and I think all of this effort, of course, will um, help us as we move ahead with our uh, the future studies, uh, both for HIV as well as also future studies for COVID. So thank you very much for all of your hard work um, in, in moving and, uh, and supporting the HPTN too. Okay, let's move on to our next presentation. We're gonna do a bit of a shift. We're moving now to COVID-19. And uh, as uh, Mike mentioned, uh, there have been concerns, of course, about the disru potential disruptions for COVID, uh, due to COVID-19 uh, for uh, many of our research sites, both in the United States and around the world. 
And uh, in the next presentation, we'll have the opportunity to hear from three individuals on uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on HIV prevention trials uh, from the site perspective. So we'll start with uh, Beatrice, who's going to be presenting us the perspective from uh, Theo Cruz in Brazil. Welcome, Beatrice. Thank you very much, Wafa. Uh, it's, uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present on behalf of the Fiocruz HPTN team. We uh, are treated to continue being part of the HPTN family. This is uh, our team's picture. We have all been working at full speed to keep uh, our uh, protocol activities during this, the COVID-19 pandemic. In this slide, you can see uh, the COVID-19 cases and death distribution in Brazil. Our site is located in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, you will see very soon in the map uh, our, where we are located. And Rio is a major epidemic, uh, a major epicenter for the COVID-19 pandemic. As you can see, as of October 5th, almost 5,000 cases and 146,000 deaths have occurred in, in Brazil. So uh, these are the overall measures that, uh, that we are using to prevent COVID-19 among our study participants and, and staff. So in the day prior to study visits, in, uh, prior to study visits, we have been doing frequent contacts with participants for visit scheduling and for retention. In the evening prior to the, scheduled to the scheduled visit, we do phone interviews to apply a structured COVID-19 signs and symptoms questionnaire. And uh, for any symptomatic participants, we cancel the visit, COVID-19 testing, uh, SARS-CoV-2 testing and medical evaluation on site is available. And uh, we do also recommendations to remain in quarantine uh, with daily monitoring by our study team uh, until lab results and remission of the symptoms before rescheduling any study procedure. We also offer inpatient care for cases that need hospitalization at the site. And uh, we also do monitoring for participants who choose not to attend study visits. And on site at the visit day, we review uh, study visits. First, we we review all study visit schedules to reduce the number of visits per day uh, and to reduce the decrease uh, the burden of participants at the site. Efforts to uh, reduce duration of visits, uh, to reduce the time spent at the site is also done. And we, we, uh, we have also the provision of individualized transportation uh, resources to minimize any uh, participant exposure when coming to the site or and going back home. And we have also adapted our uh, waiting spaces at they are all open air spaces to allow for proper physical uh, distancing, distancing at all stages of the study visits. And we also apply on site the same sign and symptoms questionnaire and, te and do temperature screening upon arrival at the site before any study study procedures are done. And all study visits are performed in offices with APA filters and or with study personnel using PPE. As you can see, uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, we are currently, uh, we have currently two ongoing HPTN studies at Fiocruz. The first uh, one is HPTN 083, where that in total enrolled 240 participants and uh, between March and September, end of September 2020, uh, we performed a total of 883 visit, visits that uh, uh, represent 90% of the planet uh, of the planet visits. So uh, we we had quite a very high retention during this six months of the pandemic. A uh, hundred that one participants had suspicion and or were evaluated by telemedicine or at the site. 50, 55 were quarantined and we had four confirmed cases. Overall among these 240, only 14 participants refused to come to the site at some point, uh, given uh, 
the COVID-19 pandemic. For the AMP study, we in total have enrolled 151 participants, but we only have now 52 active participants as the study is ending very soon. Anyway, 92 of the planet visits in the period were performed during uh, the March-September uh, period. So uh, one important point I wanted to make is that social inequalities are, are very important in the Brazilian COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have a large number of individuals living in poverty with uh, around 9%, this figure is not correct, in extreme poverty. And this has increased a lot since 2018. We have 12 million inhabitants living in overcrowded favelas, lacking piped water and proper sanitation. Black people with no schooling have four times higher chance of dying from COVID-19 and the lack of specific policies for indigenous people under report of cases and death among this population is critical in, in this pandemic, has been. So black, low schooling, low income, MSM, and transgender women had high, have higher odds of unattainability of social distancing recommendations. So we uh, facing this, all these hurdles, we uh, decided to also provide a monthly uh, basket of food goods and cooking, a cooking gas voucher in order to uh, provide some assistance to our uh, study participants mostly for the most vulnerable uh, of our study participants. In summary, building an environment where study participants and site staff can safely perform study procedures and offering reimbursement for individual transportation were essential measures to continue performing study visits at our site. The capacity in place to offer clinical care, SARS-CoV-2 testing and hospitalization for any study participant with COVID-19 was a key element to keep high levels of retention. Providing a monthly basket of food and a cooking gas voucher to the most vulnerable was also very useful to keep participants adherent to study visits. Uh, so this is a great picture from our uh, from the last year HPTN uh, meeting. Uh, this was an amazing moment for us when our team received the community award. It feels like a century ago, but we remain very happy for it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Beatrice, and thank you for all the hard work, your hard work and the hard work of the team. Uh, we'll move on to the next presentation, which will be by Amina Hussainipour, and she'll be uh, speaking on, uh, from a site perspective, an African site perspective. Welcome, Amina. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm waiting until uh, Beatrice stops sharing. One second. I'm sorry, Nina. Yes, go ahead, Nina. Uh, can you see my screen and Not, you can hear me? We can hear you, but I can't see your screen. It takes a minute to okay. share. Let's just see. Can you double click on the share screen, please? That looks good. Okay. Let's go ahead. Uh, just put it on. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we see my slides and me and um, okay. We we have a less dramatic situation in Malawi. Um, I'll start saying that Malawi declared a national disaster in March um, 20th, 2020, um, and by that it closed the schools and the majority of the borders were closed in late March. This was before any cases were identified. Um, the first case was diagnosed April 2nd. Um, there was a proposal to have a lockdown to try and prevent 
um, transmission, but this was rejected by human rights groups saying that Malawi was too vulnerable. It was taken to the courts and there was an injunction against it. Meanwhile, the backdrop of Malawi is there were elections that were ongoing. Um, there was going to be a repeat of the previously uh, corrupt election. So there was new campaigning and elections took place. Rallies were also taking place. And it was only after the election and the inauguration that there were enhanced public health measures with strict um, recommendations for masking. Um, so what this essentially meant is that our curve had initially some uh, imported cases as people returned to Malawi. And then during the campaign period, we had a surge of cases that were identified in July and August. And now you can see that there's next to no cases that are being identified and all of our COVID units in the um, urban centers are actually empty. Um, what that amounts to is we had almost 55,000 suspects, uh, 5,794 confirmed cases, 180 deaths. Um, we have done minimal testing. Uh, if you look at it per capita, there are 18 million people and less than 55,000 tests done, being done. Though I will note that as I mentioned, our COVID units are empty and they're not reports of uh, excess community deaths that can be identified. Um, with that backdrop, we started our preparations in March of 2020. Um, we established a project task force that had weekly and ad hoc meetings. Um, we spent much of March and April revising SOPs and doing trainings on clinical safety and the modified SOPs. We conducted renovations to have PPE donning and doffing stations, hand wash stations, um, structures to put screens and plexiglass in place, um, uh, marking all of our clinic areas with um, social distance uh, seating areas, uh, we had a PPE inventory management and we closely monitored our levels so we could inform how many masks, how many staff and so forth could be working. Uh, we had a clinic staff plan that had shift work so that a entire team might not go out at the same time. Um, we had to establish a workplace COVID team to manage isolation, contact tracing, quarantine uh, monitoring, and ensure that anybody who was infected um, had the clinical supplies that they needed. Um, all that being said, we had six positive cases among our staff. One was hospitalized, five were mild. Um, we have about 350 staff, so our numbers were relatively low. We did have to place 45 uh, staff members in quarantine. And the majority of these quarantines were actually from work outside of the workplace rather than uh, in the workplace. And we only had one known study participant what, that was infected um, and a very modest number that were even evaluated. Um, so screening and enrollments uh, were held and this was dictated by the networks. Um, all of our other study visits were essentially maintained. We did limit the number of visits that we had per day, um, and we had them in the socially distanced waiting area. We had screening at the entry of the building, and the suspects, if they had any signs or symptoms, were evaluated in an external area of the research uh, to the research building. We had PPE use by staff, and we provided uh, cloth masks and sanitizer to all of the participants for their home use and for their visit while they were seeing us, um, even if they were asymptomatic. So in general, the Malawi CRS operations were only modestly affected by COVID. 
Um, we had adequate structural modifications and sufficient PPE to allow continued operations, and we had few infected staff or participants. We are maintaining COVID procedures going forward for now, even though our epidemic seems to be quite quiet at present. Um, and thank you, and I'd like to uh, appreciate uh, being invited to speak on behalf of Malawi site. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina, and thank you for sharing your experience. Um, and again, uh, thank you for the commitment uh, by you and the staff. And our last presentation, let's move on to an, a perspective from an agent site, and Vivian Go will be presenting next. Welcome, Vivian. Hi, yes, today I'm gonna to be presenting the impact of COVID-19 in Asia and specifically at the Vietnam site where we're implementing the HPTN-083 study. HPTN-083 in Vietnam is being conducted in Yen Hoa Health Clinic CRS, which is located in Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam. We have screened 241 individuals and enrolled 199 participants. Our retention rates has varied between 93 and 98%. At our site every day, we see about 10 to 15 participants per day. And we conduct lab testing at Bok Mai Hospital, as well as on site at the Yen Hua CRS. This is a timeline of COVID-19 and HPTN-083 in Vietnam. You can move from the left to the right chronologically. Above the line, you can see the number of cases unfolding in Vietnam and the government's response. And below the line, you can see HPTN-083 sites activities. The first COVID-19 case was detected in January 23rd in Vietnam. Shortly after, the government closed all schools and universities throughout Vietnam. Our site remained open in early March. We did implement a COVID-19 management plan However, in mid to late March, the number of cases intensified, particularly in and around Hanoi. In an abundance of caution, we did close our site on March 25th and it remained closed until April 15th. Three days after our site closed, Bok Mai Hospital closed as well on March 28th due to the identification of COVID-19 cluster. It remained closed until April 12th. Overlap, overlapping this time period, the government issued a nationwide lockdown, suspending all non-essential businesses. This occurred from in the first few weeks of April. The number of new cases started to decline drastically, and by April, 20, by April 16th, there were 268 COVID-19 cases cumulatively, cumulatively in Vietnam and zero deaths. On April 16th, we, our, our site reopened, and this was followed by a period of 99 days with no new cases in Vietnam. On July 25th, there was a new wave of cases. This time it was located in the province of Da Nang. Our site continued to operate using the COVID-19 management plan. We did ask for, for um, participants who visited Da Nang to stay away from the site or to stay at home for 14 days following local guidelines. By early September, the, the new cases from the, from the latest outbreak had stabilized. And by September 28th, there was a cumulative number of cases in Vietnam of 1,077 and 35 deaths. There are no new local cases for the past 26 days. In, rep in response to COVID-19, we did implement, as I had mentioned, a COVID-19 management plan in Yen Hua Health Clinic. This included requiring all, our, all participants and staff to utilize personal protective equipment that were provided by our study. We also, similar to the other sites, screened for symptoms and exposures, both on the phone when scheduling visits and on site. We closely monitored the COVID situation through daily updates and daily reports from the site. And we made the decision that we could close the site for COVID-19 
through directives from HPTN, the UNC, CTU, the Vietnam Ministry of Health and or the UNC Vietnam leadership. We also created contingency plans with Bach My Lab in the case that the hospital was closed. As I mentioned in, our, in my timeline, there was a period of three weeks where we closed the sites from March 25th to April 15th. During this time, we did not conduct any study visits. However, the staff did continue to communicate with participants through the phone and social media. And this was to ensure that the people, that the participants felt supported during this time. During our three week site closure, there were a number of visits that had to be rescheduled, 98 in total. After reopening, within seven weeks, we were able to reschedule and conduct 97 of the 98 visits. So in summary, in response to COVID-19, the government in Vietnam acted rapidly and decisively, and this resulted in a relatively few number of infections and deaths nationwide. UNC Vietnam and HPTN03 leadership worked closely together to implement sound and reasonable safety measures for all of its staff and participants. The short three-week site closure that we had had little effect on long-term retention. At one point in April, our retention dipped to 93%, um, but it's currently back up to 95%. Safety measures are still in place at the site, but our st study activities have continued uninterrupted. Thank you. And thank you, um, Vivian, very much uh, for this presentation. Thanks to all the presenters. I, um, I know we don't have time for questions, but I encourage uh, everyone to please reach out to um, the individuals who presented today. And um, if, they, if you want them to share some of their materials or some of their processes. I want to also acknowledge uh, the many, many sites in the United States and around the world, because each and every one of the, those sites have had to mobilize and, uh, and really uh, almost overnight uh, prepare to, um, to adjust their procedures for COVID-19, but also at the same time to put in place uh, safety measures uh, for both the staff as well as for the participants. So thanks to each and every one of you uh, for everything you've done to um, sustain the work over the past uh, several months. It's been a difficult time and uh, your commitment is very much appreciated by all of us. At this point, we'll move to um, another highlight of our network annual meeting. And this time it's gonna be virtual and that's the uh, network uh, awards. So uh, Croatia will be presenting uh, those. Croatia? Hi, Wafa. I'm um, hoping that I have share screen and can um, uh, project the, this and get us going. Uh, I can hear you beautifully, so hopefully you'll be able to share your screen as well. <laughs> okay, I hope that's working. Uh, no? Not just yet. Maybe I need to have... Karecha, hi, this is Eric. Oh, I was going to say I can share the screen, but it looks like you're sharing the screen now. Actually, that's your email. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sharing. Sorry. Now you're sharing the whole computer. Oh, I see. My messy computer, I'm embarrassed about it. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. It's my great. Is this working? Yes, yes, it, yes, it is. Yes, Please yes, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's my great pleasure um, to um, announce the network uh, awards. It's very different, as Wafa says. You know, usually there'd be a lot of applause and um, and and jubilation when these announcements are made. And I hope that the chats in some way can compensate. And um, it's my pleasure to do this announcements on behalf of the Performance Evaluation uh, Committee. So first up, I want to thank uh, Jonathan and Cheryl for laying context and a bit of background on the Community Engagement Award. And there's no surprises here that uh, 
that, that this is this collaboration of four CRSs, the CRS in Pata Barranco, CRS in Pata San Miguel, CRS CITBM and CRS Via Libre for their collaborative effort in putting together this amazing Impact the Heroes Universe um, campaign that utilized five comic book su superheroes in different uh, communication approaches to support education, recruitment, and retention efforts at local venues and uh, online social media campaigns and during community events. And uh, this was all um, in the context of the HPT and OA3 campaign. And, uh, and, and it was amazing. And I think there's no question about all of us being so impressed with what they've been able to do. So congratulations to these four uh, CRSs for their coll collaborative effort and really upping the game even more in terms of the community engagement process. Next up, um, as usual, we will have a winner and in the Community Engagement Award also a runner up. And here we would like to recognize the Houston AIDS research team whose uh, community engagement was instrumental in the development of HPTN 091 and the Transgender Stakeholder Engagement Plan that were bolstered the community relationships in this marginalized population. So congratulations to the Houston AIDS research team. Next up, we have the Accrual Award and this, the winner of that is the Centro de Referen oh my gosh, my Spanish is awful, but it's, let me try, Centro de Referencia y Tremanto DST HCRS in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And this again is for HPTN 083, where the site enrolled 136 participants between June and December, 2019. And uh, this was 133% of the expected target enrollment for that time period. Honorable mention uh, to uh, the, uh, JHU, uh, the MU JHU Kampala CRS for enrolling 98 part participants into HPTN 084 from June through December 2019. Congratulations to both the winner and the runner up in terms of the Cruel Award. And again, for major contributions to advancing both HPTN 03 and HPTN 04. Uh, next, we have the Estimated Retention Award. And here the winner is the Bothas Hill CRS that had the highest visit completion rate of 98.9% for AMP. And we haven't heard much about AMP, but we will be soon uh, in the context of the B, uh, NAB work that's coming up. And the runners up um, was two sites. And here we have the Chiang Mai University Prevention CRS uh, for the HPTN 083 study visit completion rate of 98%. 0.5%. And just to give you a better sense of that, that's a completion rate of 2,905 of the 2,949 expected study visits. And um, joint uh, runner up is the Spillhouse CRS that combined visit completion rate for both AMP and 084 of 4,182 of the 4,301 study visits for a rate of 97.2%. So this is amazing work um, all around for the winner, Bodas Hill, and also the runners up, Ching Mai and Spillhouse CRSs. So thanks for that. And then moving on to the laboratory category, the winner here is University of Pennsylvania Lab at CHOP. And this is based on their responsiveness to queries, attentiveness to shipments, and, um, and notably, no re reportable notes to file. The runners up, uh, runner up here is the Spillhouse CRS Lab based on their responsiveness to queries and attentiveness to shipments. We now move on to the staff awards. And uh, this is a new category of awards and the selection here is done by the leadership from uh, the respective uh, support groups and here specifically for Central uh, Laboratory, we'd like to recognize your Agi, 
I think most of the CRS is from Africa. Uh, not surprised, your has been for the past 15 years with great diligence, providing incredible support uh, that spans over 10 clinical trials, including HPTN 052 and 071. And he's currently providing support for the two HPTN 084 trials that are ongoing. And I think everybody will um, agree with me about the way your approaches, his support work in such a patient and compassionate way, always generous and sharing his laboratory knowledge. And all of us look forward to his visits and uh, great enthusiasm in recognizing your for this uh, Central Laboratory Staff Award. The next staff award is from the Data Management Center and that goes to Leslie Cottle. Again, well known to all of us over many uh, decades and for her dedicated uh, commitment to ensuring that every study gets adequate support and that um, the, all the resolutions that need to be done are done uh, timelessly by sites, ensuring a clean database and uh, rapid uh, data analysis that can proceed from there. And last but not least is the staff awards from the LOC. And uh, the, um, it was a great uh, here uh, that FHI 360 and particularly Nero and others had to face in terms of who and there was no agreement because it took a team effort led by Mary Beth McCauley, Kyla Gomez Felciano, Andrea Jennings, Jonathan Lucas, Cheryl Blanchett and Sarah Stone for ensuring the successful development and implementation of HPTN 083. I think in this past year, we've had, and, and, and couple of years, some uh, very innovative and challenging trials and hats off to all the CRSs and the staff at uh, each of the uh, it, LOC data management and, and, and also um, central lab for their continued um, uh, and consistent support to ensure the best products emanate and for those uh, CRSs going the extra mile. So Wafa, with that, thank you very much for this opportunity to announce the awards and to um, congratulate all the winners and the runner-ups. Runner and for those uh, who did not make this list, we hope you inspired to, uh, to try for 2021. So thanks again. Thank you, Croatia. And as everybody can see from the chat boxes, uh, all the popping up congratulations to all of the winners. This is a wonderful acknowledgement of uh, all of your hard work over the past year. So thank you, Croatia, and thanks to, um, and congratulations to all of our winners today. Okay, let's move on. Um, and then we move to another highlight of each and every one of our annual meetings, which is the scholarship, uh, uh, in the new scholars introduction. And as Mike mentioned, we are extremely proud of the uh, scholars that we, both the domestic as well as the international scholars that HPTN has been supporting. And uh, they've been amazing and they've inspired us and hopefully they've been inspired as well. Uh, by working with the HPTN. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Daryl Weaver and David Sirwada to introduce the new scholars. Thank well, you very much, Wafa. I hope you can hear me and thank yes. you for allowing us to be a part of this today. Um, as Wafa said, we're here, um, David and I, to present on the HPTN um, scholars. I'd first like to reintroduce you to our current um, scholars. These are our domestic scholars, Dr. Rodman Turpin, Dr. Raquel Ramos, and Dr. Derek T. Dangerfield II. Each of these scholars um, is actively engaged in their research and working with their mentors. And you can see here the studies they represent. One of the beauties of working- slides, uh, uh, Daryl, uh, do you have slides to share or? I um, am sharing, oh. Because it's showing yes, on yes. the slides are up. We can okay, see them. Now we see them. Okay. Okay. Thank there you. was just a, an odd delay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. So you see our scholars, Rod, Rodman Terrapin, Raquel Ramos, and um, Dr. Da Derek Dangerfield. Our international scholars, David, would you like to introduce our current international scholars? 
Right. I have the pleasure to introduce the um, fifth uh, intake of the International I'm Scholar. I'm not hearing David, but for the sake of time, I'll go ahead. And if David unmutes and comes in, he'll take over. We have Hello? Dr. Lizette rousseau Jemwa, Dr. Rogers um, Sikabera, and Anita Moreres. These scholars are working with 075, 069, and 067. And I must say in working with our international scholars, it's been a wonderful collaboration with David and Croatia, but also for the scholars to work across national and international borders. Our new cohort of scholars, which who will begin very shortly, include our domestic scholars, um, Dr. Ogun Bajo, Dr. Converse, and Dr. Amutu Anugago. And additionally, Dr. Um, Noel Saintville. Each of these scholars was selected from a competitive pool. And we have our international scholars repre represented by um, Chida Boala and Nom Nomta Bel Mandla and Manuela Boalo. Each of these scholars, again, and I must say in, in, in reviewing them, really speaks to the impact, I think, of the scholars program internationally. The rigor of the proposals is, was, has, was phenomenal this year, and we're really looking forward to working with these scholars and looking forward to the January 2021 engagement with our scholars in their orientation and full onboarding. And I absolutely um, owe all credit to our colleagues and our supporters for this. And we look forward to a continued and fruitful engagement in this important endeavor, which we hope will contribute to the changing of the very nature of the science that we do, and certainly the outcomes for communities on a global scale. Wafa, thank you very much for the opportunity. And thank you, uh, Daryl. Thanks to you and uh, David Sawada and Sten and Koresha for um, for leadership of our scholars program, as well as also thanks to the LOC and also the Statistical Center yes. uh, for all their support of the scholars. And thank you to many of you on this call who have served as mentors uh, for these scholars. So uh, uh, congratulations to all of you uh, and to the HPTN for this uh, remarkable program. So uh, let's keep moving and uh, we'll move on next to uh, a statistical presentation, as we always do. We always have a statistical session that's very well attended and uh, highly anticipated at our annual meeting. And Jim Hughes will be presenting today on behalf of the statistical team for the HPTN. Jim? Okay, thanks. Uh, quick sound check. You can hear me, Wafa? Yes, I can. Great. Thanks. Uh, let me share my screen. Before I actually start, I wanted to. Um, add my congratulations uh, to Tom for the Ward Cates Award and also sort of from personal viewpoint, thank him for all the help and mentoring he's provided to me, um, to me during my career. So uh, congratulations and thanks, Tom. Okay, what I am going to, there we go, um, talk about today is some work we've been doing at the STAT Center for uh, developing placebo counterfactuals for PrEP studies. Um, most current... Slides yet. Uh, I don't see the slides, Jim. No slides. Okay. Uh, I, I, I can do see, see this. Yeah. Okay, oh, you've just got that uh, old uh, slow internet, I guess, Wafa. <laughs> Okay, uh, um, so current PrEP trials typically have been designed with active control arms. So uh, the HPTN 083, 084 trials of long acting injectable cabotegravir use a TDF FDC uh, daily oral pill control arm. Uh, but nonetheless, there is interest in understanding uh, the potential effect of these new PrEP agents, such as cabotegravir, against a placebo, not only as perhaps supplementary evidence of efficacy, but in understanding the population impact of uh, these agents. So one approach to doing this is to use uh, external uh, trials that have been conducted in more or less the same time frame as the current trial. Uh, external trials that do have placebo arms to form a so-called counterfactual placebo arm. Uh, it's important in doing this that, that there is overlap in the trials, both in terms of population, eligibility criteria, and time. 
So what I wanted to do was uh, talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing specifically for 084. 084 is the women's trial in cabotegravir uh, where women in sub-Saharan Africa are being randomized to either daily uh, TDF-FTC pills or injectable cabotegravir. And the three potential trials that we could consider using, uh, external trials that we could consider using for counterfactual placebo evidence uh, are the ECHO uh, trial, the vaccine trial HVTN702, and the AMP trial that you've already heard a bit about today. Um, ECHO, uh, as, as most of you would know, it was a uh, trial conducted again in sub-Saharan Africa women, uh, randomizing women uh, to three contraceptive arms, so DMPA, uh, IUD, or an implant. Uh, and that trial showed essentially no difference in HIV incidence between the arms. There was a very low PrEP use, so we would propose in this case uh, combining all the data from that trial as an effective uh, counterfactual placebo. Uh, the vaccine trial, 702, did have a true placebo arm. Uh, again, that was conducted in South Africa in uh, HIV seronegative women. And uh, in that trial, PrEP use again was reported as quite low. So the placebo arm would be uh, a pretty effective pure placebo with, without much use of background PrEP, even though it was, was available to participants. Um, the AMP trial results have not been reported yet. That, that was, uh, as we've heard, a one-to-one-to-one um, uh, randomization between two doses of vaccine and uh, placebo arm. If, as in 702, if, if PrEP use is low in the placebo arm, then one could imagine potentially using the placebo arm as that from that trial as well. This shows the overlap in study time of these three trials with the 084 trial. So the methods to do this that we've been developing are, are quite straightforward. Uh, let's assume we have a target trial. I'll take as an example, the 084 trial with some number of subgroups. Uh, these might be individual sites. We might aggregate to the country level or other region um, uh, um, subgroups. Uh, in, each sub of, in each of the subgroups, we would measure the person years in the target trial, call that M sub I, person years in subgroup I, and the overall incidence in the target trial among the subgroups uh, where there is overlap with the, with the um, external trial. So for this particular exercise, I'll, I'll use the ECHO trial as my external trial. And we, so we assume that the external trial has uh, subgroups, uh, overlapping subgroups in the same sites or regions or countries as a target trial, and that we've measured the HIV incidence in uh, the placebo arm, or as in the case of ECHO, we're gonna combine all the arms uh, for that site or region, whatever that subgroup is. So then the counterfactual placebo is simply a weighted average uh, of the incidence from the placebo arm of the external trial where the weighting factors are the person years in the target trial. So just a weighted, weighted average of the incidence from the external trial to mimic the distribution of per, person years in, in the target trial. We can also then develop a counterfactual placebo uh, or a counterfactual relative risk, which would be the observed incidence in the target trial over the counterfactual placebo instance from the external trial. And we can get confidence intervals for both the counterfactual placebo instance and the counterfactual relative risk. We've, we've done the work to uh, develop those formulas uh, for what it's worth. That's all done as, as usual for relative risks and instances on the log scale. And then we convert it back to the original scale. So as an example, uh, again, taking the ECHO trial, um, again, just to remind you, that's the one with the uh, three arms for uh, contraception options. Um, there were no differences between the arms. So we're comparing, we're combining all the arms and there were three 
overlapping countries in uh, ECHO and 084. So we'll take country as our subgroup, uh, Eswatini, Kenya, and South Africa. Um, this chart here then goes, gives the person years in 084 as of last spring, at least, uh, the incidents in the ECHO trial. And those two numbers then can be combined, uh, a weighted average of the ECHO incidences using the person years from 084 as weights to com uh, compute a counterfactual placebo incidence of 4.4% uh, per year with the confidence interval shown here. For comparative purposes, the uh, expected incidence that was used during the design of 084, the expected background incidence um, in the absence of uh, TDF, FTC, or Captavir was 3.5%. Since 084 is ongoing, can't, we don't have uh, information on current incidents in that trial. So one could also do further stratification by uh, demographic groups such as age. Uh, although if you start to make too many small little subgroups, the data uh, on incidents in the external trial would start to get relatively thin. Uh, and it's important to understand, of course, that counterfactual estimates don't have the strength of evidence of a randomized comparison. Uh, so, so any information on this should be combined with other available uh, evidence, uh, such as, uh, for instance, information on the adherence and HIV incidence in the active control arm uh, of the um, uh, target trial. Uh, and also, we may be in a somewhat time limited ability to apply these methods in the sense that uh, I think it is important that the data from the external trial be overlapping in time with the PrEP trials. And as uh, we go further and further along in time, there may be less uh, information, contemporaneous information available uh, on the placebo arm from external trials. So just like to acknowledge the uh, collaborators uh, from Sharp that have worked on with this, Deborah Donnell, Faye Gal, and Barbara Richardson, and of course, uh, our founders. So thanks very much. I'll pass it back to you, Wafa. Thank you very much, Jim, and very interesting. And uh, um, obviously this methodology will need to be um, utilized uh, in the future as we move ahead with doing other studies where um, uh, often the placebo is not available. Uh, let's move on to our next presentation. Um, and our next presentation will be um, uh, Hi, Wafa. It's Oliver. I believe I'm next. Yes, you're next. I'm sorry, I was disconnected for a while. Okay. Go ahead, Oliver. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let me see. I was asked to do a presentation of lab testing for um, SARS-CoV-2. And this has been a very, very active area of work for laboratorians as of late. And um, that should be pretty, um, pretty evident. Let me see if I can do this. All right, so one of the things which we need to know uh, if we're going to identify people who've been infected with, currently with, or have been infected with SARS-CoV-2 is what we're trying to detect. So one, one of the things which we're trying to detect is the presence of the virus that's often done through RT-PCR or uh, through actually now uh, identifying uh, the presence of the antigen of the virus. And for people who have been exposed, these would be antibody tests. And because this is uh, a virus, which is often in mucosal areas, uh, we can test for IgA, but we can also test for IgM and IgG. Though these assays have been very different than what we normally see 
in other uh, infectious diseases. And then also using this sequence data, we can perform molecular epidemiology. So, oh boy, are there so many different detection methods for SARS-CoV-2. Now, in terms of getting the samples, that's actually one of the big problems because most often the virus is located in your lungs. And so to get a sample, we can't really go into your lungs because doing bronchial lavages is, is just not something that's doable to scale. So we get nasopharyngeal swabs or oral pharyngeal swabs. These are the swabs that go to the back of your uh, head and don't feel very comfortable. There's also getting saliva or passive drool or even stool samples can be used uh, to amplify out the presence of the virus. Uh, the blood, there have been people who have been positive uh, by RT-PCR in the blood, but those are individuals who are very, very sick. Now, we start in the middle there with the virus and there's all sorts of ways where we can extract and then we can amplify and then we can uh, detect the presence of the virus. Uh, either, again, if we go uh, just with the antibody test, those would be more antigen, but there's a whole host of different assays and it's actually really, really difficult to keep up. And these are some of the places whose job it is to keep up with what is actually going on and how effective these particular assays are. So the US CDC, the FDA, Find Corporation, WHO, all have wonderful sites which uh, give you information on the performance of the different assays that exist. Uh, I actually recommend the Find uh, Corporation. They're, they have a very useful interactive uh, website where you can look, compare directly the performance of these different assays to one another. One of the other things that makes the detection and the laboratory testing for uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, difficult is a, a nature of the actual infection itself. So you have uh, prior to actual seroconversion or actual symptom onset, uh, you get infected, the virus um, proliferates, and then you, you could you can be PCR positive for some time before you actually get symptoms, but then you're, you're positive for a while. But the, the maximum sensitivity is in three to five days post-symptom onset. And certainly with a lot of the early RT-PCR assays using um, uh, nasal swabs, nasopharyngeal swabs, you had a maximum sensitivity of about maybe 75 to 80% in that three to five uh, day window. And then that would rapidly decrease to less than 50% by about week two. Now, also what you have is an issue where people who are asymptomatic can often not make antibody to uh, the, the viral infection. Uh, symptomatic individuals, certainly hospitalized uh, individuals, all seem to seroconvert by about two weeks after symptom onset. Another odd thing about this virus is that you often have the co-reactivity um, of IgM and IgG at the same time, or really maybe a day later for IgG than, I, um, than IgM. And this is normally you have a, a week or two delay in the IgG versus IgM. So you also have some, some interesting cross reactivity that's going on in terms of your antibody response. This is a really wonderful summary paper of when these different assays uh, become uh, detectable. Uh, this was one of the first papers which showed this difference in the positivity or uh, um, percent positivity by the different assays. Uh, and you're looking here, uh, this 
uh, in the top call, uh, row, you have the RNA. So this is by RT-PCR, then antibody, which would be either IgM or IgG, and then you have IgM itself and IgG itself. And you're looking at the days since symptom onset and when you have a positive result. And again, the, the more red you have, the more positivity you have. You see for RNA, here you have maximum sensitivity at about day four. And again, it rapidly decreases to less than 50%, certainly within two weeks. Uh, antibody, you see seroconversion by two weeks after symptom onset. And the fraction of individuals who are positive by IgM and IgG pretty much parallels one another. Uh, the, um, the rows below show the number of, of samples uh, for each time point that were tested. Uh, wow, did I? Okay, sorry, I hit end. All right, so here we have, uh, these are some rapid tests which were done in our lab. And these were done on hospitalized patients. And so they all seroconverted. And you can see in the top row, you have an individual uh, who was uh, negative, had your IgM appear a day before the IgG. In the next one with a lot of samples, you actually see IgM appear for a large number of days before the IgG. And then finally, on the last one, you have an individual who never has an IgM response, really, and just goes straight to IgG. Another thing which is of great interest and makes it very difficult to do the normal types of serologic studies that we do is people who are not hospitalized often do not seroconvert. And by often, I mean like five to 10% of these individuals. Uh, so the serologic assays themselves, uh, there's a large number of them which are actually really good. So when you talk about sensitivity among samples from hospitalized individuals, you're getting sen sensitivity at about close to 100% at 14 days post symptom onset. And specificities, there have been studies done with uh, more than 50,000 samples uh, to show specificity at like more than 99.5%. So also what we've seen, so the, the panel here with the uh, US data shows uh, different specificities. Uh, I mean, yeah, shows different uh, antibody prevalences in these different uh, areas of the United States. This was a large study by, done by the CDC. And what they actually showed was that the prevalence of antibody was about 10 times higher than the prevalence of uh, individuals with a positive RT-PCR. And this is um, often what we've seen is if you take the total number of individuals who have been RT-PCR positive in that particular area, about a tenfold greater prevalence of antibody positive individuals that you see. Uh, the next panel is from a very large sero study done in Iceland. And Iceland seems to be an area where they can do some really uh, interesting uh, studies on SARS-CoV-2 because they had uh, such good data in terms of tracking everybody who is RT-PCR positive. So here, this is a study of about 30,000 individuals. They had more than a 1,200 individuals who they knew were RT-PCR positive. They did six different types of serologic tests. And among these found that among non-hospitalized individuals, you had about 90 to 95% of the people were actually ser uh, seroreactive. Uh, again, you have individuals who are hospitalized, which are in the orange dots. Those were uh, all uh, seropositive, again, by about two weeks after infection. Um, 
But again, here, this is a very clear study about the lack of antibody positive individuals among known PCR positive individuals who were not symptomatic. One area where we have had a lot of success with though is the molecular epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2. There's been a lot of sequencing of this virus. Uh, the group called Next Strain has been really instrumental in terms of providing uh, real-time um, information about how the virus, uh, which types of viruses are where. There is not a lot of variation of this virus. Uh, and from that, though, they still are able to calculate um, what is a molecular clock and also how uh, the virus it introduces itself into different populations. For example, here where I work, uh, physically based at Johns Hopkins University, uh, we sampled 620 samples between March 11th and 31st and found that the diversity of the virus here in uh, Maryland was as diverse as the virus was worldwide. And the, our interpretation of this is that we had multiple introductions of the virus uh, by that time. Uh, and so we can see there in terms of the, you've got the phylogenetic tree showing the se sequences from um, here in, in from Hopkins and um, the different clades which are associated with different uh, sequences from different parts of the world. Another study, this was by Mike Warby, recently published in Science. It seems like everything about SARS-CoV-2 is published recently. Um, showed how the virus and when the virus actually moved from continent to continent. So in summary, our testing for SARS-CoV-2 are good tests, but there's limitations. One of the chief limitations is the source of the sample. Um, and this co corresponds to what are low sensitivities in terms of your, your standard sort of RT-PCR tests. Uh, there are low specificities with the antibodies uh, testing, particularly with uh, individuals who have not been hospitalized. Uh, there were some problems with cross-reactivity. I think, honestly, a lot of those things have been worked out. There is not a lot of evaluation for the test performance of these assays in low to middle income countries. We've had um, tremendous supply chain problems uh, for these diagnostic tests. And uh, the molecular epidemiology data actually has really helped us understand uh, the spread of this infection. Uh, I would definitely like to acknowledge uh, all the support for the work that we've been doing, and thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Uh, so I think, as I mentioned, the first uh, goal of our um, uh, of the FOA was to look at uh, to identify novel ARV-based uh, method uh, prevention methods and delivery systems. Secondly, is to develop multi-purpose technologies uh, called for brief MPTs for HIV prevention, as well as for prevention of, uh, you know, unplanned pregnancies and also prevention of other sexually transmitted infections. Thirdly, was to evaluate broadly neutralizing antibodies, BNABs, alone and in, or in combination to prevent HIV acquisition, and this in collaboration with the HVTN. And lastly, to design and conduct uh, population-specific um, integrated strategy studies that combine, as Mike mentioned, the biomedical, socio-behavioral, and structural interventions. And the goal is to maximize the effectiveness of these interventions. So when we look at the mission of the, um, of our, of the HPTN, it falls into two buckets, essentially, two categories. One is developing new biomedical interventions, like I mentioned to you before, the ARVs, the MPTs, and the VNABs. And the second piece is to optimize the integration of proven interventions so we achieve uh, the high effectiveness and impact. So I always think of the HPTN mission as based on two 
um, in two areas. One is discovery and the other one is impact. So let's look at this figure here and it summarizes the um, scientific agenda and our conceptual framework for our uh, agenda moving forward. So our goal is to uh, take uh, promising antiretroviral agents, NPTs, BNAPs, and then uh, hopefully uh, move them through the different phases of development um, and then hopefully through this effort, we'll identify novel new biomedical uh, prevention methods, as well as also utilize established biomedical uh, prevention methods in, and bring them into our integrated strategies agenda, combining them with socio-behavior interventions, structure interventions, so that we can um, implement these integrated strategies in the various populations at risk and then achieve the impact, the desired impact, which is uh, population level HIV uh, prevention. So briefly, I'll go through what we said we're going to do and what we're doing. Number one was um, the uh, long acting, of course, focus on long acting antiretroviral uh, drugs as part of our aim uh, one uh, for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And the goal is to do this uh, through the uh, development phases, the usual traditional um, development phases for new products as well as also a great interest in evaluating uh, various delivery systems. There's obviously we're using inject injections in, uh, in HPTN 083 and 084 with calotegravir, but the goal is also to uh, seek, as Mike mentioned, other uh, delivery methods like implants and patches and as well as topical products if they do have a promising systemic effect. What about uh, AIM-2? And AIM-2 is the one focus on MPTs. And, uh, and, and here we're really trying to move the agenda forward so that we can uh, bring HIV prevention with other uh, prevention priorities, uh, particularly be because we realize that often it is, um, it is the populations at risk for HIV are often the same populations who are in uh, urgent need for new contraceptive methods or new STI prevention methods and so on and so forth. And then the delivery options for MPTs and there could be co-formulated or uh, co-administered or co-packaged. And you can see here on this slide, there are various ways of thinking of how to move forward on the MPT agenda uh, as we think of the next uh, five, uh, seven years of the HPTN um, research agenda moving forward. Now, AIM-3 is focused on uh, BNABs, and this aim is, uh, of course, to design and conduct these studies uh, in collaboration with the HPTN. And we're in an exciting time now because, as Mike mentioned, uh, we will soon uh, be sharing uh, the results from uh, the M studies and certainly the insights and uh, we're very optimistic that the insights uh, from, from AMP itself can be very instrumental in uh, moving the whole BNAP agenda forwards in terms of a uh, use of uh, one BNAP or combination of BNAPs or, or other types of uh, BNAPs that are uh, tri-specific BNAPs, for example. So this area of work is likely to be very much informed by the results of AMP and uh, to be um, hopefully accelerated uh, accelerating this uh, this part of our um, of our own agenda, and then um, aim number four is to design conduct integrated strategies for HIV prevention. And uh, as I mentioned to you before, obviously we need we are very committed to identifying novel biomedical uh, methods or or bringing in any novel biomedical methods that have been identified by others and bringing them into our integrated strategy agenda as well as, of course, using established methods. And you can see, you saw this figure before that Mike showed, is our goal is how to, through using this approach, this novel approach of integrated strategies, we're, we're hoping that this will enable high uptake and adherence with these interventions to enable achieving um, high effectiveness and impact. And the goal is, of course, for the integrated strategies to, for us to focus on priority populations that are most severely impacted uh, by HIV, both in the United States and around the world. The whole idea behind integrated strategies is to tailor uh, these interventions to individual and social context. We very much want to embrace the idea of status neutral approach and in our integrated agenda. Uh, this is to avoid, of course, um, 
the impact of, of stigma of HIV. And also we appreciate that, uh, that uh, we, will need to, we will need to utilize various types of studies, for example, Vanguard studies um, that answer critical questions that will inform the design of definitive studies. And of course, most importantly, is we want this to be very nimble, flexible approach. So as soon as new tools are identified or delivery methods are identified, that they can, slot, can be slotted in immediately into um, planned and ongoing integrated strategy studies. Now, in our proposal, we put forth uh, several kinds of studies. I don't have time to go through them, but we focus on the, these are for populations at risk in the US, for example. We focused, of course, on what are the most important populations like men who have sex with men, young MSM, women at risk, and people who inject drugs. And we already, and I'll tell you a bit more about um, the, or the ongoing work um, already in developing integrated strategy studies for two of these populations, for uh, MSM in the United States, HPTN 096, as well as for people who inject drugs in the United States, uh, 094, as well as uh, also for, um, for transgender uh, women, and I'll get to that uh, study in a minute. Uh, but we're also, of course, very interested and have uh, put into our proposal some interesting ideas uh, for studies that would focus on young uh, MSM as well as for women at risk in the, in the United States. In terms of globally, we also appreciate the need for uh, integrated strategy studies and the populations we focused on are um, uh, the women in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, heterosexual men in Sub-Saharan Africa, MSM and transgender uh, women in Sub-Saharan Africa, South America and Asia, transgender uh, women in, uh, globally as well as in the Americas, and also an interest in tackling the whole issue of non-injection substance users amongst MSM in the Americas. I'll now touch base on some of the work we've already done to jumpstart our uh, agenda. And uh, many of you are aware of HPTN 091. This is a very interesting study. It is a Vanguard study uh, that's looking at uh, the objective is to assess acceptability, feasibility of a an integrated approach of integrating uh, HIV prevention services in a, in, with a gender affirming hormo hormonal therapy and peer delivered peer navigation, health navigation amongst uh, four uh, uh, transgender women, and also as part of this Vanguard study to assess uh, PrEP uptake and adherence uh, in, in the study um, uh, that's. Uh, that's, that's, get, that's moving along rapidly and hopefully will be uh, soon um, uh, in the field. Uh, just to show you the schema, this, uh, this design here, um, transgender women will be enrolled and randomized to an immediate versus deferred intervention arm. And um, I don't have time to go through it, but the goal is in the immediate arm is this concept of co-location of services and peer navigation. And, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to learn from the study the feasibility and uh, acceptability of this intervention, but also as well the effectiveness in terms of PrEP uptake and adherence. Now, HV10094 focuses on another very important population that has had, uh, that's received uh, little attention or not sufficient attention, that's uh, people who inject drugs in the United States. And this study will also utilizing uh, integrated services, one-stop integrated service to be delivered by a mobile health delivery unit. And uh, the idea is to bring together all these services and assess the impact on uptake and adherence with medication for opioid use disorder, uh, HIV treatment and prevention medicines, um, as, and compare that to a control arm that provides, rather than co-locating or integrating the services, uh, provides these services through referral to static um, facilities. And this will be a two-arm, individually randomized, open-label study. You can see the schema here, again, in terms of the intervention um, arm, which is going to be utilizing the mobile unit versus the control arm, which involves an active control arm of navigation to uh, community-based organizations and facilities. Another study that we've also, uh, HPTN has been working hard on, and the teams have, uh, for all of these studies, have worked enormously hard, is HPTN 096. 
And the goal and the purpose of 096 is to assess an integrated HIV status neutral population based approach to reduce the HIV incidence in Black MSM in the South, uh, southern part of the United States, and to achieve this through increasing HIV testing, increasing the uptake and adherence with uh, PrEP, as well as also to achieve a high viral load suppression among uh, individuals who are identified with HIV infection. And this study is, uh, of course, um, uh, very much uh, been developed in collaboration with many, many, many organizations in the United States who are particularly interested in, in the health of Black MSM, as well as uh, also in collaboration with the CDC and, and other um, very important agencies, local and national agencies. And um, HPTN 096, the design is complex, but I always say that because we have a complex problem, the challenge of what to do about uh, prevention of HIV amongst the uh, Black MSM in this country, it includes an integrated strategy uh, at um, several interventions, uh, some of them focused at a community level, as well as others at an organizational level to reduce stigma, an interpersonal level with peer support, as well as uh, HIV and STI testing at an individual level. And the hope is, and the goal is through these, these, uh, uh, these different types of interventions focused on different levels that we'll be able to, again, to, to um, provide or um, multi-level social support and reduce uh, stigma as well as overcome the structural barriers to healthcare services, enabling um, Black MSM from these uh, uh, study communities to enhance their HIV testing for those who are positive uh, to achieve high viral load suppression for those who are negative to achieve high um, uptake and, uh, and adherence with PrEP use and persistence on PrEP and ultimately reduce HIV incidence in this community, uh, in this community, in these communities. And just that you're aware, the study is uh, focused on actually uh, randomization of, uh, of communities to uh, this integrated strategy versus a standard of care uh, communities. The goal is, of course, for this study in particular, as it is still in development, is to also bring in uh, potentially new tools that we've identified. And the one that comes to mind, obviously, is the use of injectable agents, both for cabotegravir, for example, for uh, both uh, prevention as well as uh, also injectables, potentially also for uh, treatment uh, with the hope of achieving high uptake adherence for both uh, treatment and prevention. Now, in addition to these studies, of course, we're looking ahead. These are the studies that we're moving along, have moved along in this transition period, but we're hoping to jumpstart and pursue some of these other ideas that I mentioned very briefly on uh, slides before that are focused on some of the other uh, priority populations, both in the United States and elsewhere. Now, how do we move the science forward? We're very fortunate to have uh, several scientific committees that are focused on a specific uh, populations uh, and um, and that have been and these scientific com committees are really established to inform our science and review the concepts and generate new ideas and as well as of course to uh, solicit and hopefully solicit ideas from the greater community both the HPTN community and beyond. We also are very fortunate to have as well to inform the science our working groups and these include two newly established working groups, the Biomedical uh, Sciences Working Group, as well as the Social Behavior and Structural Sciences Working Group. And these have been added to our well-established community working group and ethics working groups. And all of these are very, very important elements of uh, science generation uh, for, as well as the conduct of the science uh, for the HPTN uh, movie. I have, I have always been part of uh, of our, uh, of our of the fabric of the HPTN and will continue to be so as we uh, move forward. So I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention to this brief uh, presentation. I think we'll uh, thank you to closing remarks from your end. Thank yeah, you. I think uh, I think that um, in the chat box and the Q and A, we've tried to answer a lot of questions, but of course there may be others. I think. Um, well, first, thank you for participating in the first PTN global experiment. 
we've never done this before and it seems to have had its successes and failures. And I wanna thank everyone staying with us and all the speakers <clears throat> for doing this. Um, I do think, you know, we're now in this time of transition. We're about to report the results of big studies, uh, which I think our group can be proud of. We're about to have um, begin our next seven years. It's kind of very almost biblical. It's seven year cycles like of <laughs> plowing the earth. So we're about to start our next seven years and we're very excited about it. Um, and I think that 2020 is the most unusual year that any of us a lot, I think there's no one old enough to have been around for 1918. So this is the most unusual year any of us have ever lived, a difficult year in every possible way. And I think the people in this call have demonstrated something really interesting to me, the network, the PTN started to deal with an emerging pathogen, um, HIV, and we've demonstrated tremendous flexibility in contributing, doing continuing this work, but contributing, working on a second emerging pathogen, uh, SARS-CoV-2. I would hope that um, that the work we're doing in both spaces are gonna make contributions that are really, really important uh, prospectively. Um, I think that uh, in my mind, it's like, well, we might, we'll, we have to see what happens in 2021. We're gonna start planning an annual meeting where we all get to be together again, hoping that the conditions allow us to actually have a meeting that, that um, has become quite important to this community. We might have another webinar in the spring. It might be valuable um, because now we learned how to do it. You know, since we've done this, we might have to do this again to prove to ourselves we can work the circle, the uh, translator uh, phenomenon in the uh, globe. But I think it might be worth doing in the spring and we'll consider that. But certainly we're gonna get together in the fall and I'm hoping we get together in person. Um, any questions you have of us given the size of this audience um, and the way we're doing this, any questions should be emailed to Niru. And, and then we would immediately respond one way or the other, any questions that weren't unanswered or any questions that, that surfaced from this uh, webinar. Uh, I, think, I think we're running over time, not too badly, only 15 minutes over the plan time, and that's not fatal compared to what could have happened. So I think the best thing to do is to thank everyone for staying with us, um, the majority of people. To congratulate all the recipients of the awards, uh, Gracious so carefully and graciously I handed out to thank Carl uh, for uh, providing and for Tom Fleming for his work and getting the Ward Cates Award. And I think we'll be back in touch with you as always. And, and thank you for participating in the first ever inaugural and maybe first only <laughs> Uh, HBTN virtual web, annual yearly webinar. So I'm going to just stop and thank you, and then we're all going to leave. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank everybody, you. and take care.